everything is trigunatmak. This prakriti is trigunatmak. That means we are ruled by the three gunas. In each one of you, in each one of us, you know, we have a little bit of sattva, a little bit of uh, rajas, and a little bit of tamas. Sattva is represented with color white and is absolute purity and God orientation, upward growth. The movement of sattva is upward. Rajas is pure practicality, passion, and worldly growth, sustenance. You know, uh, the desire, passion for life. Colors for life is rajas in the middle. Rajas is good when it is when it collaborates with sattva. It gives you grandeur and 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 a kingly status. But rajas is in the middle. It can also collaborate with tamas, give you excessive hunger and desire. All right. So rajas is in the middle, the red. And then there's black, which represents resolution, destruction, annihilation, removal, which is inevitable. We don't view black as negative, but we view it as undesirable things in us. We view it as undesirable things in us. So very, very good morning and Jai Shri Ma. May the Goddess shower her benevolence and grace on all of us. May we be so, so, so blessed to recognize her in us. So 10 Mahavidyas, Dasha Mahavidyas has been very, uh, very close uh, to my heart subject. I've always loved to explore the, the goddess energy and explore the Mahaprana. I call her Mahaprana and the Mahashakti, Adi Shakti. I've always loved to explore what is she about and her fathomless presence. We all recognize now her fathomless presence and the, you know, the different facets and the different rupas avatars of her presence around us. She is everything because she is the manifested self. She is everything because she is the one that is manifested Paramatma. You know, and when we talk of her as she, when we address her as she, it's basically a genderless, it's only for our brain to understand her as she. But it is genderless. You know, the Mahaprana or the Adi Shakti is a genderless. Um, her presence is genderless. And uh, she's not limited just to us feminine uh, women, but also fills up the bodies and the cavities of all men. You know, she is the one that works. She's the one that drives the whole cart. She's the one that creates color. She's the one that is enthralling and captivating this entire creation. He is there and she moves. His presence is there and she moves. His presence is there and she creates whatever is tangible, whatever is seen in this world. The divine consciousness, again genderless, the divine consciousness, which is again genderless. He, we, she, we talk about he and she only for our understanding. It's not he and she at all. You can say it's potential energy and kinetic energy, the nearest of what science can understand. Potential energy is just there. It's just there with fathomless possibilities and infinite possibilities of creation. And uh, this potential energy, however, cannot create unless it changes its form into something kinetic. So the, the arousal of Shakti within, you know, the Purusha, the arousal of Shakti within the Purusha, the arousal of Shakti within the, uh, the, the core of Paramatma is what gives birth to Adi Shakti. Adi Shakti, which is at par with this potential energy itself, it is, it is at par, so there isn't anything that she is coming out from him or she is an extension of, she is him and he is she at that point where creation starts. You know, so Adi Shakti, we call it Mahaprana also, we call it Mahashakti, is the, is the, uh, is the beginning of creation. It is from this point that creation starts, creation, sustenance, resolution and involution, we call it. You know, it goes ahead into sustenance, it goes ahead into dissolving and finishing and then inward again coils up into that point of creation. You know, so it's a big round circle that is Adi Shakti, all right? So the Dasha Mahavidya, which is our core subject for discussion and learning, we are all learning here, including me. When I speak, then I'm learning as well, you know, because every, every, every time I talk about her, every time I talk about the Mahavidya, there's something opening in my head as well. 
you know every time she teaches something more in depth to me as well so when we talking about dasha mahavidyalaya there are the very very primordial very primordial streams of energy that are coming out of adi shakti these are before the puranic times before the puranic times later on we hear of navadurgas and we hear of many other forms of devi that were you know named the mahavidyas have always existed they are very primordial very primordial and they do not have you know the depicted bodies and the depicted uh, colors or feminine bodies for that matter they don't have mahavidyas are absolute primordial crude energy raw energy coming out of the adi shakti and uh, holding within their ten forms the entire creation the entire creation they are the different levels of evolution they are the different facets of what creation can offer and from them have sprung the emotion of this creation all the emotions of this creation has come out of these mahavidyas and if you understand the the structure of these mahavidyas this this wisdom to me was departed uh, you know uh, was given to me by my gurudev and hence it is very very original now you will not find this information written anywhere this is imparted in oral traditions from in the guru shishya parampara you know so the understanding that i have received from him about the mahavidyas is absolutely incredible and crystal clear it gives you clarity about what we are talking about when we are talking about mahavidyas we are talking about nature we are talking absolutely about nature the microcosmic nature and the macrocosmic nature so the information that we we will be discussing and uh, sh- and sharing today is is related to you as a person as well as all of us as a collective whole you know it's relating to everything microcosmic as well as macrocosmic so let us understand something about you know the uh the way these devis have come into existence the mahavidyas the dasha mahavidyas let us begin a small prayer first to invoke the, the 10 of them very small two line prayer so that they bless us with with the revelation yeah Om. A small invocation first for Ganesha, and then an invocation for the Devi. Ekadantam chaturhastam pashama kushadharinam radam cha varadam hastair vibhranam mushakadvajam raktam lambodaram shurpakarnakam raktavasasam raktagandhanu liptangan raktapushpai su pujitam. भक्तानुकंपिनम देवम जगत्कारणम अचुतम अविभूतम च शिष्टयादौ प्रकृते पुरुषात् परम एवं ध्यायति यो नित्यम स योगी योगिनां वरः ओम नमो व्रातपतये नमो गणपतये नमः प्रमथपतये नमस्ते स्तूलम बोदराय एकदंताय विघ्ननाशिने शिवसुताय श्री वरद मूर्त नमो नम कालीतारा महाविद्याषोडशी भुवनेश्वरी भैरवी छिन्नमस्ताच विद्याधूमवती तथा बगला सिद्ध विद्या चातंगी कमलात्मिका ये दश महाविद्या सिद्ध विद्या प्रकीर्ति ये दश महाविद्या सिद्ध विद्या प्रकीर्ति ओ लवली so all of us know that before creation happened before the creation happened there was just this beautiful potential energy everywhere there was just consciousness there was just parmatma everywhere and there was no creation no human beings no trees no animals nothing it was just absolute silence and bliss and this potential energy what we call parmatma purush wanted to explore the fathomless possibilities of creation and couldn't do it all by himself couldn't do it all by itself 
So started this churning movement of the Adi Shakti within. The churning movement of Adi Shakti happened and then the three facets of the Shakti first came out. The three facets, like an inverted triangle, when we visualize an inverted triangle. Kali was the first creation out of the Mahavidyas and Kali is at par with consciousness itself. She is the transcended Devi that is at par with consciousness itself. She is Paramatma itself. In the Dasha Mahavidyas, we say Kali is Paramatma itself. She is completely transcended form of the Devi. Transcended what? Transcended the world. Transcended the entire creation. She is beyond creation, right? From Kali comes another roop of Tara. Tara is created and uh, a very beautiful wisdom uh, aspect of the, of the Kali, you can say, a wisdom aspect of the Kali, represented by white. These three Devis that I'm talking about first, they are representing the three Gunas. That was the first of the creation. The three Gunas were created first, then the later, um, uh, you know, the elements and uh, the entire creation happened. All right, so Kali herself is at the core of consciousness. She's transcended energy and from her emerges Tara. So there is a Kali in Tara. There is a Kali in Tara. And from Tara comes Shodashi. Shodashi is represented by red color. Kali is represented by black. Tara is represented by white. And Shodashi is represented by red color. These are the formation of the three gunas. The devis that hold the gunas of this entire creation. The upper triangle. I'm trying to make a figure. I have a very beautiful digital uh, picture of this what I'm drawing. So the upper triangle, which is represented here, this is Kali, this is Tara, and this is Shodashi, the upper triangle. And then from these three gunas, you know, the creation of elements, uh, Mahabhutas started, and the creation of all the other Devi facets, you know, emerge out of these three. So if I can just write down the names here for a moment, um, it'll make it easy for you to understand. So from Tara comes, uh, from Kali comes Tara and from Ka Tara comes Shodashi. That means there is a Kali in Tara and there is a Kali and Tara in Shodashi, right? There are, these are the three forms of Devi that emerge first. And from them, the remaining of the, this bigger triangle represents Adi Shakti and the, and the Shakti that creates this entire, you know, universe. These centers are at a microscopic level and a, macroscopic level understood as chakras. We understand, understand them as lokas, chakras, dimensions, vibrational fields, however you may present them. Kali, Tara and Shodashi being the upper triangle is at the core of all the triangles that come thereafter. She, th these three are at the core of all the triangles that come thereafter. For instance, the fourth one here is Bhuvaneshwari. All right, this is Bhuvaneshwari. Bhuvaneshwari is at our crown. And Kali, Tara and Shodashi come in the chakras which are above the crown. They are the, the points which are above our crown chakra. Bhuvneshwari comes at the crown. We call her Mahamaya. We call her Maya because she is the one that manifests and creates this entire reality. She casts the illusion and the involvement of all of us in this world, in this tangible world. She is the one which creates body consciousness for all of us individually. All right, so you have after Kali, Tara, Shodashi, Bhuvneshwari, which is called Mahamaya. And then we have Bhairavi over here. At the, at the brow level, there is Bhairavi, which is time. You know, she creates the dimension of time and makes us feel that we are in the dimension of time. Yes, I'm writing the names. Bhuvaneshwari, Bhairavi, Chinnamasta. Yeah, thank you. A little bigger, huh? Yeah, a little bigger, they won't read it otherwise. Hmm. Yeah. So, Bhuvaneshwari is at our crown, Bhairavi is at our brow. This is the dimension of time. We stay in the time reality because of this. 
at a macrocosmic level, the time dimension is what Bhairavi is. You know, the depictions of all these Devis, I will explain in detail when I'm giving you each of the Devi, I'll give you in detail everything and I'll make you note down everything as well. But to just take a brief of all of them, Bhairavi depicts time and she controls time, the before and after of the dimension where we are living. After Bhairavi then uh, comes Chinnamasta at the throat level. Chinnamasta comes at the throat level where the Shuddhi of Prana happens. She is the one that is purifying the prana and taking us higher. When, when I brief you about the devis from bottom to top, then you understand how evolution takes place. You'll understand how, at the moment I'm explaining from top to bottom, right? So, Chinnamasta. And then comes Dhumavati. Dhumavati is at the heart level. She is at the heart level, an ocean of compassion, quite contrary to how she's depicted normally. She's depicted as a, as a gray colored, uh, you know, a woman who is a very ugly countenance and a very widow-like appearance, which is very, uh, uh, almost like a draught of emotions, paucity of emotions, but she's absolutely reversed. Ocean of emotions. And she annihilates and takes away everything that is unwanted. She willows and puts into fire everything that is not required. She takes one to complete renunciation. She takes one to complete renunciation, annihilating pain and suffering forever. All right, so Dhumavati. After Dhumavati, you have these bottom three chakras or the bottom three levels which are absolutely earthy and worldly. All right, to begin with, Baglamukhi. Baglamukhi, which is represented at the solar plexus level, represents, represented by yellow because it's a worldly chakra, solar plexus is yellow. And then we have Matangi, which is at the water level, Swadishthan level, Matangi. And then lastly, you have at the root chakra level, Kamlatmika. Kamlatmika is like a Lakshmi, present day Lakshmi, what we see sitting, seated on a lotus. Kamlatmika is represented sitting on a lotus. Absolute earthly abundance. So now to understand this again, from Kali comes Tara, there is a, there is a Kali in Tara. From Tara comes Shodashi, there is a Kali and Tara in Shodashi. This triangle of the black, white, and red, which represents the three guna, this triangle and this combination of the white, red and black is there in all the other devis. That means when we talk of Bhuvaneshwari, for instance, there will be a black aspect of Bhuvaneshwari, there will be a red aspect of Bhuvaneshwari and a white aspect of Bhuvaneshwari. The white aspect of every devi, each of the Mahavidyas, takes us into absolute enlightenment and takes us into consciousness. The gateway to enlightenment and complete nirvana or salvation is there from every Devi. Each of the Devis is capable of liberating you from the cycle of samsara. Each of the Devi. Because this triangle is there in every Devi. Bhuvaneshwari, for instance, has a black, like I said, there's a white and there's a red. White takes us to enlightenment and to salvation and can give us complete moksha. Red is sustenance energy, it is glory, it is grandeur, and it, is, it carries the, 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 the glories of the earth. So it is purely rajasic in nature. White is purely sattvic in nature. Red is purely rajasic in nature. So it gives you the riches and the grandeur of earth, life on earth, right? And black is dissolution, destruction, and removal. Black is representing dissolution, destruction, and removal. It removes, annihilates what is not required. These three, the sattva, rajas, and tamas, are the complete cycle of this creation. It, it, it represents a complete cycle. For instance, the black takes you again into white. The white takes you to red, and the red takes you to black. We are constantly rotating with these three desires and with these three levels of desires all the time. Yes. It's interesting that black is typically understood as tamas, which is, and then here it's beautifully reframed. So that's a very beautiful point you're making. Tamas word has gone into our mind conditioning as a negative word, which it is not. You know, within tamas also you have tamo sato, tamo rajo, tamo, uh, tamo. Tamo, tamo can be said as, said as complete dark. But tamo rajo and tamo sato, many of the sadhanas in the, in the Vama Margi Tantra, many of the sadhanas are, uh, uh, you know, tamo sato and tamo rajo. 
So they take you towards enlightenment as well. Okay, they take us towards, uh, they take us all to enlightenment. Tamo tapo, is, tamo tamo is what we say completely destruction, where we are actually finishing something. You know, people are finishing something. Again, I don't view that negatively because unless we finish something, nothing can be born. You know, creation has to have death as a, a very intricate part, a very intimate, a very intricate, and a very essential part. The resolution is a very important part. Otherwise, creation will have no space. Space is created because of death and because of uh, trees that wilt and flowers that wilt and uh, human beings and animals that die. You know, space is created and the cycle goes on, the maya goes on. So within Bhuvaneshwari, within Bhairavi, all of these Mahavidyas, you have the black practices, you have the red practices and you have the white practices. All of these Mahavidyas. And therefore, you can transcend the world through these practices or you can rule and, and, and gain the, uh, you know, the richness of this world or you can enter into the darkness and go back into Kali, you know, go back into the, uh, uh, into the darkness of the universe again. So not viewing negative things as negative particularly, but understanding that in the dark, everything survives. In the dark, everything survives. There are a lot of possibilities in the dark. The dark, dark is always towards the end, but there is a dark white also. So similarly, Kali, for instance, you know, the dark side of Kali is very, very dreadful. It's very dreadful, very scary, but she's an ocean of compassion. The white side of Kali is like, she's an ocean of compassion and can easiest and the shortest path to salvation can be through Kali. We've had many examples of saints who have been Kali Bhaktas. And we know how embracing and uh, how uh, beautifully she has taken them on the other side of the ocean. You know, Ramakrishna Paramhans has been there. Many Kali Bhaktas we all of us know about. So she is an ocean of compassion. And Kali resides in all of these Mahavidyas. Tara resides in all of these Mahavidyas. Shodashi resides in all of these Mahavidyas. This triangle is a very, very intricate part of all the Dasha Mahavidyas. The Kali, Tara, Shodashi and Bhuvaneshwari are called Mahavidyas. They are called Mahavidyas. They are called Mahavidyas because they can help you to transcend that world and the, the bhakti and the worship and the sadhana done for these four devis in the beginning is basically for transcending the world and to uh, attain liberation. The Bhairavi, Chinnamasta and Dhumavati are called Vidyas. They are vidyas and they are for practical living and they are for bringing in perfection in a human being to go to the higher level. They are called vidyas because they chisel us, our personalities, they chisel our personalities and they bring us to that level of perfection so that we are able to go higher. Bagla Mukhi, Matangi and Kamlatmika are called Siddha Vidyas. They are called Siddha Vidyas because they give you Siddhis, they are worldly. Baglamukhi, Matangi and Kamlatmika come at the solar plexus uh, Swadishthan and the Muladhar. They are, they give you Siddhis and they give you attainments which are, you know, desired by many people. Many people desire Siddhis and they are the ones, that's why a lot of magic, uh, enthralling work, mesmerizing work is all done with the with the upasana of these three devis. Matangi especially is known for all the crafts, all kinds of crafts. You know, Baglamukhi is known for stamban and uchatan maran and all of these very harsh, powerful kind of uh, vidyas. And Kamlatmika for all the worldly gains and for all the worldly prosperity. So when we study these Mahavidyas one by one, I would love to dictate to you a couple, a small, very small pointers so that you will remember them. Uh, for, for those of you, I have a couple of them here who attend my classes regularly. You know that I can print all of this and give it to you in, in papers, you know, but that never goes here. You, you don't read them, even if you read them, the punctuations, the emotion, the bhava that is being expressed doesn't go there in the print. You know, where some pointers, if you write down now forever, all your life, you'll never forget them. They'll go right into your brain and you'll always remember them. So small little pointers I'll make you write down for Kali, Tara, Shodashi, Bhuvneshwari, Bhairavi, Chinnamasta, Dhumavati, Baglamukhi, Matangi and Kamlatmika. All right. Any question? Does anybody have any question you can ask? There is, there is, we'll have an open uh,
we have an open forum here. If there is something, and don't don't go back with a doubt in your mind. Yes, Damini. Okay, uh, thank you, Ma. I feel very happy to receive these teachings again. And I have, since I studied the Mahavidyas with you, also looked at some other people who have explained them. Um, there's uh, David Frawley and Kavita Chinayan, who I've looked at, and they have described the Mahavidyas according and relating to different points of the chakras. So I was wondering, is that a different system that they got uh, initiated to or that they speak about or a different understanding? Um, and is there just one to follow or would that be, would that not matter? No, I, I haven't got your question completely. You want to know, are there, are there different ways of looking at it? Yeah, where to place the Mahavidyas, because there is different teachers, especially in the Sri Vidya uh -huh. Foundation. People mm -hmm. are following um, that, I guess. And it I've doesn't, doesn't matter. You can, you know, see the different sampradayas talk about the same thing. These are abstract subjects. These are yeah. subjects which don't have a solid, um, uh, you know, there's no written matter anywhere. And most of these come from oral traditions. So what, as a sadhak, what you should do is you should listen to everything. And then, you know, when we are doing for instance, we'll do a certain practice here now in, in today's class as well as tomorrow's class. Focus on the energy and see how you feel. You know, some things that are meant for you will, will uh, reveal. You know, you reveal. It, it comes out from within. That this, this seems just beautiful to me or right to me. So information is all always scattered, especially with Mahavidyas. It's very scattered, very, very scattered. And different uh, uh, lineages talk you know, differently. However, I think there would be commonality in everything. There would be there would be a common point in everything. You just need to figure it out um, when you read what has been given to you. Just try to figure out what is suiting me and how I feel about it. Yeah. Specifically to chakras, is this is this some thing that is not in order or what? I haven't got your question right. Yes, yes. Some people have changed around which goddess belongs to which chakras, and so with for the, me that was very confusing. Yeah, number one, number one, the goddess does not belong to a chakra. You know, yeah. there there is a frequency matching. There, there's a vibrational frequency. We are all talking about vibrations and frequency. The frequency aligns with a particular chakra. The frequency aligns with a particular chakra. For instance, Kamlatmika is a very gross energy and aligns with the earth chakra. You know, it's all about earthly abundance and earth chakra. And also the, the worship that has been done over centuries has been for prosperity, for glory, for victory, and, you know, things like that. So Matangi is, is so full of arts and creativity that aligns with the Swadishthan. You know, it aligns with the Swadishthan. The music that goes with it, the worship rituals that go, it aligns with the Swadishthan Chakra. So these are observations more than, you know, they're observations that this is aligning more with the Swadishthan. Similarly, Bag Baglamukhi, Pitambari, she's called Pitambari and it's a complete yellow energy. The vibratory frequency of Baglamukhi is very strong, like the, just like the solar plexus. It's just like the solar plexus, very strong and uh, has the power to control, to stop, or to remove. You know, that's why it is aligning with the solar plexus. The Dhumavati and the Chinnamasta are, you know, the heart and the throat, because Dhumavati especially, uh, uh, the element, ruling elements are in correspondence with these chakras. Earth element, then you have Matangi, water element, Baglamukhi, fire element. Then you have Dhumavati is air element. You know, the, these are written, this is written in the stotras and in the, the air element. And then Chinnamasta comes to ether, where Pranashuddhi is happening. You know, Chinnamasta comes to ether, where Pranashuddhi is happening, and the uh, uh, decapitation of the removal of the of the head completely is is the Shuddhi done so completely that the Ida Pingla and Sushamna are oozing out. That is what is represented by Chinnamasta. Bhairavi is the time. You know, should beyond ether. You know, beyond ether is your your basic levels are over. Elemental levels are over. Beyond ether, it is time. And then beyond time, it is Maya, which mm -hmm. is Bhuvaneshwari. So when you, when you understand this from the elemental point of view, from the energy frequency point of view, this arrangement seems right. You know, this arrangement seems right. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you. I was yeah. just a little confused in my research, but that was perfect. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. And you should like, it, uh, as in most of your, uh, you know, modalities and, and um, subjects related to these 
especially such very abstract subjects which are not modulated and put together. You need to just read everything, accept everything and allow your silence to teach you. You know, the, basically our intention is to invoke them within us. Our intention is to invoke them within us and to experience the energy within us. And uh, the, all, all good teachers have tried their best to put everything in order, in the right order for the students to, uh, you know, understand and grasp it because it's all scattered. Otherwise, you, if, if you don't arrange it in a proper order, it's very difficult for the head to, uh, you know, absorb, for the brain to absorb. Yeah. Lovely. So the elements, what, what I spoke about, um, up to uh, Chinnamasta, the ether is over. Yeah. So that means physical manifestation stops here. Bhairavi, therefore, is time. Bhairavi, therefore, is time. And she's at par with Kal Bhairav. She's at par with the, you know, the, the male polarity of Bhairav. And uh, a very dreadful and a very, de very deadly looking uh, goddess. You know, if you see the pictures of Bhairavi on uh, your internet or on in any manuals, you see that it's all scattered hair and very fiery looking very fiery looking, like a million suns shining. Her energy is like a million suns shining, Bhairavi. And uh, so, uh, and often she is shown, uh, uh, you know, in the Smashana, she is shown meditating and uh, very active blazing energy in the cremation ground. Smashana is a cremation ground. And so that's why she is the winner of death itself. She is a winner of death itself and therefore she can eradicate fear from us forever. Fear of death, fear, any kind of fear. She is also Bhairavi, also I think somebody spoke about the Chosat Yogini just in the morning, right? Bhairavi is the, is the power that has the Chosat, the 64 Yoginis in her control. They are the Dasis of the Bhairavi Shakti, Mahavidya. And uh, uh, she rules, you know, this entire world with her fiery presence. She rules the entire world. Anything can come in her control. That is why most of the, out of all the other Mahavidyas, Bhairavi is the one which is invoked to take care of the dark energies, to, you know, control the dark energies. She is like, she's also called Chandi. She's also called Chandi. She, she's the one that can, a person that can rule the Smashana, that means the cremation ground. She's completely having death in her control, right? And uh, 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 let us talk something about Kali. And you note down, I will dictate some points to you about Kali. Let's begin with Kali. And then we'll go downward. We also have over the years, you know, where teachers have tried to, gurus have tried to put all of this knowledge together for the sadhaks to go more deeper inward uh, into connecting these goddesses. The fear factor from the goddesses has been removed. At least the teachers that I have spoken to, the fear factor from the goddesses has been removed, which is there in a lot of tantric uh, practitioners. There's a lot of fear with these Mahavidyas. They're very guhya. Guhya is very secret. They have been kept very secretly because they're very dreadful and they're very, you know, um, scary, which they are not. You know, my experience with the Devis, with the Mahavidyas has been extremely loving. They are very, very benevolent and very loving goddesses. And when you experience them within you, you realize that they are scary and dreadful as mentioned by many because they're unseen. They're unseen and they are, uh, you know, difficult to experience. That's why people, a lot of people are scared. And also the black, black practices associated with these devis have kind of kept them very far away from the main streamline of worship. You know, the black practices associated with this Devi is very intense. And that's why these uh, Devis have remained very guhya. I was very surprised when I went to Kamakya uh, a uh, couple of years back. You know, I was very surprised that none of the temples of the Mahavidyas over there are done up in the traditional way, like how you see so much of grandeur in our temples. You go to South India and you see such grandeur in the temples. There is, you know, uh, lighting, bright lighting and gold and silver and the goddesses are decked up with beautiful jewelry and clothes. But none of the Mahavidyas are staying in the temples like that. They are very, very raw, very raw, almost coming out from the ground naked. You know, and there is no clothing or any kind of uh, uh, decorations on them. Even the temples are so simple and humble. They have, they, all the temples are kept the way they were, you know, from then. There's no show put up there uh, uh, with, the, with the temples at all. 
uh, all the all the Mahavidyas, in fact, Dhumavati was such an isolated place, Dhumavati, because people are scared to go to her. Uh, you know, the, the in the new age traditions, the Puranic traditions and the new age traditions, a lot of people discourage the worship of Mahavidyas because uh, they, you know, they, they are presented very scary, which they are not. You know, very earthy, they're very earthy, they're very primordial, they're very, very, very basic energy that is living in us. They are energies that are living in us. And so um, I encourage all of you to, and you've been doing this for 21 days, amazing when I read your, the list of speakers and the, uh, the lectures that were happening here, I wish I could attend all of them. They were so beautiful. Uh, intense cleansing and intense invocation and activation of the Devi energies inside. I'm sure all of you are really, really very blessed to have gone through these, you know, 21 days of purification and 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 uh, befriending the the vidyas, you know, befriending the devis. You've made friends with them forever now, and they're going to live in you forever. Hmm? So Kali, you can write down first. She means something that takes away darkness. Kali means something that takes away darkness. That's why she's called Ka and Li. Kali is the one that takes away darkness. She's the power of consciousness at the highest form. In fact, she is consciousness itself. In fact, she is consciousness itself. She corresponds to planet Saturn. She corresponds to planet Saturn. Each of these devis have corresponding planets, corresponding um, Dravya and uh, Vanaspati, you know, corresponding plants and uh, all the all the creation will correspond to each of the devis. All right, so Saturn corresponds to Kali. Then she's consciousness in motion. Her sadhana can dissolve limitations, and our awareness. Her sadhana can dissolve limitations. That means when you want to grow, when you want to expand. Her sadhana can dissolve limitations. And your awareness can expand to infinity. Um, small little sentences of what the sadhana does. Every Devi I will give you. So that you can decide for yourself which aspect of you needs to be worked on. You know, a simple Kali Mantra can help you remove any limitations that you have. And can help you expand and grow in your awareness. Right? We talk about sadhana tomorrow. We'll talk about a lot of healing tomorrow that can be done with the Mahavidyas and the mantras. That uh, that I'll share the file today itself uh, with Nilimaji and she'll share with you the mantras, list of mantras for each of the devis. And you can pick up your own healing. Um, yes? Uh, Ma, thank you so much for being with us. And sorry to interrupt your flow. It's just about Kali. So it feels like the right time. So I'm pretty new on this path. And Kali is the embodiment that I really long for the most. And she's the most intriguing to me. So Kali is the form that I really long for the most. And I feel the most intrigued by. But I feel like I need some more reassurance. Because I still have fear about approaching her. And I don't have fear of losing the worldly attachments. I just have fear of like completely losing my mind. Because how could my limited self ever grasp what's beyond creation and what's infinite. So I really want to do her sadhana, but I need a bit more help to feel comfortable. Can you share anything more? Yeah, your your question is that you're very scared. Yes. Of, of this whole thing. And it's too overwhelming. Yes. Yeah, to absorb everything. And you don't know how to begin with your sadhana. Yes. Oh, I, I'm afraid to begin because I'm afraid of the potential. Of... It, 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 the infinity. That exactly. it can. It can. Yes. Yeah. So you, what you need to do is just meditate, you know, and pray. Prayers are very humbling. Prayers are very humbling. Let's say, for instance, if you want to do a Kali Sadhana, you wish to, but there's something inside you which is so scared of blowing it out and, you know, yeah. So maybe just uh, 11 days of prayer, you know, to ask her, seek that open me up, you know, to accept you. And the process that I want to enter into. Let take out this fear. She can take away the fear. So maybe a couple of days just dedicate for praying and meditating. Before you actually start the mantra sadhana or the focus sadhana. Sadhana for Mahavidyas can be done with mantras as well as with yantras. You know, they can be done with yantras as well. Yeah. So different ways. We'll talk about that tomorrow. So before you're ready to, to for that, you seek 
to the to the goddess that open me up for to, you know so that i'm able to see the infinite me mm-hmm. and i'm able to experience you as infinity mm-hmm. yeah and as long as you're in the body your soul won't run away from the body so never worry yeah. <laughs> thank you yeah anybody else wants to ask something okay next so her sadhana can dissolve limitations and the awareness can expand to infinity yeah uh, her nakedness signifies boundlessness and infinity she is depicted naked kali is naked her nakedness signifies boundlessness and infinity and her hair represents freedom the necklace of skulls around her head the necklace of skulls around her head have alphabets have alphabets on them we call it varnamala in english in in hindi varnamala is the a b c d of hindi alphabets the 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 necklace of skulls around her neck have alphabets which are the basis of all the scriptural writings which are the basis of all the scriptural writing she is therefore at the foundation of all the scriptures she is therefore at the foundation of all the scriptures she enhances kumbhaka kumbhaka is the gap between your breath you know where inhalation and exhalation in between gap is called kumbhaka she enhances kumbhaka self knowledge she enhances kumbhaka self knowledge and samadhi at least two malas of her mantra are recommended at least two malas of her mantra are recommended every day okay the next is tara let us write something small about tara she corresponds to planet jupiter and has two absolute polarities and has two absolute polarities the saumya and the ugra the saumya which is soft and gentle and ugra which is aggressive and harsh the saumya and the ugra kali is transcended and tara is transcending so she takes you at the at the brink of enlightenment tara takes you to the brink of enlightenment takes you to the threshold of en- enlightenment kali is transcended and tara is transcending she removes false notions she removes false notions and frees us from conditioning she removes old conditioning she ha- she holds a pair of scissors if you see the picture of tara she holds a pair of scissors it cuts attachment she helps you to cut attachment you know these small little pointers what you are writing will help you to at some point decide which devi sadhana will help you to get over whatever is obstructing or blocking you on your path right she helps you to cut attachment she is the goddess of knowledge wisdom she is a goddess of knowledge and wisdom and considered a form of saraswati she is considered akin to saraswati at par with saraswati her capacities are power of silence movement within mind and emotion her capacity capacities are power of silence that means a very good goddess to teach you meditation power of silence is inherent in how if you focus on tara your meditation experience can become very deeper can become very deep movement in the mind and emotion and all levels of communication all levels of because you saraswati all levels of communication just a quick question yes. matangi is also considered an yes saraswati. saraswati she is a tantric saraswati as well matangi yeah. interesting yeah. so tara is sometimes called neela saraswati neela, tara neela because she is deep blue in color mm-hmm. and uh, tara has gone more to the buddhist culture yes. you know and matangi has remained in the indian culture yes. both of them are considered saraswati and there yeah. are 21 taras in the buddhist yes in the buddhist culture she has fanned out into many different yeah. forms yeah. and uh, uh, in fact the goddess is represented as tara over there you know yes. yeah 
Uh, this is this is a much later migration, I feel, historically speaking, mm -hmm. uh, uh, much later. Because the Mahavidyas have existed much before even Buddhism was there. Mm -hmm. You know, so Tara has gone there and uh, very beautifully uh, elaborated the different facets of the goddesses. I have been given the name Tara, blue Tara, white mm -hmm. Tara, red Tara, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's interesting. Yeah, that yeah. There are two Saraswatis in the Mahavidyas. Yes, yes, yes. She is considered Saraswati as well. Mm -hmm. But more because of the upper, more Matangi is considered than yes. Tara because Tara is in the upper triangle, which is like, ah, yeah. Yes. yes. It's, it's a white color. That's why we say Saraswati because she represents the white part of the gunas, mm -hmm. Sattva. Mm -hmm. You know, so she's considered pure purity and knowledge. Mm -hmm. but, but more of tantric uh, sadhanas related to Saraswati are done at the Matangi level. Yeah. So, in a communication, inner peace, and yeah. She's also associated with purification and transformation and transcendence, especially when people are on the path and they are stuck and they are not able to experience samadhi or they're not able to reach to the Kali level. Then Tara helps you to, she takes you into the samadhi, you know. So she is a bridge for all the sadhaks. She's a bridge, you know, a little sadhana. You know, when we talk about sadhana, whenever we talk about sadhana, it, what does the word sadhana mean for all of you? I'm sure you've discussed all of this in the past 21 days. But sadhana is a, is a, is a collective kind of a word that, that is customized for everyone. Set of practices that you do, a committed set of practices that you do every day. Every day, every day is your sadhana. Just like a sportsman, for instance, does his sadhana with the exercises and with all the you know the the routine that he follows that is his sadhana similarly spiritual sadhana is a word that encompasses all the things that you do every day for your spiritual growth and spiritual emancipation yeah this is this is the word sadhana so when you choose sadhana if you understand what each devi is doing you can take short sankalpas you know for different devis to experience that energy Mahavidyas, with Mahavidyas, especially people do that. Before you settle down with one of the devis that really you think is going to liberate you, until that you can experience all the devis one by one. We'll talk about suggestions. I'll give you suggestions to do the sadhana tomorrow. What kind of cycles you can do, crisp and neat cycles that you can do with the devis. Okay? Let's write something about Shodashi. So she corresponds to planet Mercury. And is the experience of consciousness at the universality level, at the universe level. She's also called Raja Rajeshwari. She's called Sri Vidya. She's called Kameshwari. Lalita. Compassion and illumination are her forte. Compassion and illumination are her forte. She teaches us the world is a place of beauty to be savoured and enjoyed. She is inexhaustible abundance. We also call her Shri. We also call her Shri. Shri is Sha and Ri together. Shri means Sha and Ri together. Sha is Purusha and Ri is Prakriti. You know, so she is complete in herself. If you do her sadhana, you get complete within yourself. She is also called Shri. And she's inexhaustible abundance. Shodashi is also called Tripur Sundari. She's also called Tripur Sundari. Because she is the the Tripur. Tripur means the mind, body, and soul. Tripur means the mind, body, and soul. So she helps you to align and bring these three together. She helps you to align the mind, body, soul together. That's why she's called Tripur Sundari. She is an embodiment of 16 secret vidyas. She is an embodiment of 16 secret vidyas. She is called Shodashi, which means in Sanskrit 16. It means in Sanskrit Shodashi means 16. She is called Shodashi because of this and also because her sadhana opens in the sadhak, in the seeker, 16 levels of wisdom or modification, the mind and the desires modify at 16 different levels. That is why she is called Shodashi. 
the sadhak undergoes 16 different levels of modification and changes in, in his state of mind. When you worship the goddess, the goddess becomes you and you become the goddess. This is the speciality of Shodashi. When you worship the goddess, the goddess becomes you and you become the goddess. The goddess lives through you. The goddess lives through you. So we've been experiencing Kalavahana from Devi Puram, which is that practice. Yes, I was amazed. I read about that and I was so amazed. I said, how blessed you all are. How blessed. And Gurudev's uh, lineage itself has come. I'm, I'm absolutely awed and touched. You know, this is absolutely big, big blessing. Yeah, amazing. So we come to Bhuvaneshwari now. Let's write something about Bhuvaneshwari. She's called Mahamaya. She is called Mahamaya and corresponds to planet Moon. She is the mother that sustains all that she has given birth to. She's the power of sustenance. She gives you the power of sustenance. Whenever you are facing any worldly problem or you are wanting to manifest something, there is a desire you wish to manifest, there is a goal you want to achieve, attain, be it spiritual or worldly, and there is something that you want to become, you know, Bhuvaneshwari, because she's Mahamaya. She can spin that energy in you. She can, you know, enthrall every cell of your body. What happens when we do sadhana? When we do sadhana, we are self-enthralling our cells. The cells of our body get captivated with the mantra that you are doing, with the dhyana that you are doing. They get captivated you know, and enthrall and every cell of your body then generates energy to make that happen. So manifestation process is something that is a speciality of Bhuvaneshwari and this process includes holding a goal, invoking her and surrendering the goal to her. It in involves holding a goal or a holding an intention in the mind, invoking her with her mantra and then surrendering this goal to her. Surrender is a very, very, very important aspect of manifestation. Otherwise, the, the intention or the goal rides on the ego. If you don't want your intention or your goal to be spiking your ego, then the, the trick is that you surrender this goal and intention at the feet of the Devi. You surrender it at the feet of the, this is what I strongly desire, this is what I really want, this is what is really going on in my head, and this, this I feel is going to make me happy and complete. I surrender this at your feet. You do her sadhana, so she will either fulfill it or transform it for you. She will either fulfill it or transform it for you to what is best for you, to make what is best for you. All right, so surrender is an important aspect of manifestation and Bhuvaneshwari is the Devi for manifestation, right? She's the queen of the universe, goddess of love, space, and eradicates suffering, eradicates suffering. Even people who have issues with the moon, moon is mind, all of you know that moon is mind. When the mind is disturbed, when the moon is astrologically not favorable, any uh, delusions or any mental aberrations or depression, mood swings, um, any kind of a jolt that the mind has gone through. Bhuvaneshwari helps you to heal because she immediately, you know, uh, activates the moon and moon is compassion. It's compassion and love. So she, she aligns, realigns your state of mind. Hmm? So mental illness, mental suffering, mental illness, mental suffering, nirbuddhi, nirbuddhi is low IQ and mental illnesses can be healed with her sadhana. Her mantra is reem. We'll talk about mantras more tomorrow, but at this point it's important to mention reem, which we consider as a basic bija akshar for Devi. Reem is considered as a basic Vija mantra for Devi and it is her mantra, you know, which is taken as the supreme mantra for all the goddesses because she is at the point where manifestation is happening. As you see here, Bhuvaneshwari is at the crown where manifestation is happening. That's why her mantra, Reem, is considered to be the Bijakshar for Devi. Yeah, Her mantra, Reem, is called the Devi Pranava. 
it is called devi pranava it is equal to om it is at par with om a very very beautiful sentence uh, you can write this down kali creates kali creates events in time she conceives she is like a womb kali creates events in time and bhuvaneshwari creates objects in space that means your intention first goes to kali and then goes to bhuvaneshwari for manifestation you get it all right now let's come to bhairavi let's write something about bhairavi all of this is going in into your heads okay so don't think we are wasting time writing down it's all going in our head <laughs> bhairavi so she represents all the nine planets bhairavi represents all the nine planets you have each of the mahavidyas there are 10 of them nine planets and nine vidyas are there the bhairavi represents all the nine planets so when there is a complicated astrological suffering coming because of this debilitated that debilitated this dosha that dosha mangali people have all kinds of suffering then all the nine planets need to be you know um invoked or shant you make put them to peace bhairavi helps that you know she she removes all the grah doshas bhairavi removes all the grah doshas she is the control of controller of prana vayu bhairavi she is here she is control of prana vayu that means all the prana that is moving in your body all the prana which is moving in your body in your breath um different pancha pranas and upa pranas that are moving you know in your body the controller of this is bhairavi it's here mm -hmm. so even the energy of tapas you do tapasya tapasya means you're doing your mantra sadhana you're doing your meditation you're doing your kriyas you're doing your uh, nada practice whatever practices you're doing the energy generate even yoga even when you practicing your yoga all the practices is generating tapas or fire she absorbs all this fire and grants to you that what you seek you know so she's a controller of prana in your body point 1 then she is shown sitting on the top of a headless corpse if you see the picture of bhairavi scattered hair and she's sitting on a dead body where there is no head very scary pictures these mahavidyas have are huh? very scary but it's like i said very uh, uh, misguiding the pictures are they are so loving they're so 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 loving yeah so she's sitting on that headless corpse because it's it's representing a slayed ego a, a, a completely cut out ego she's also called smashan vasini and chandi she is also called chandi or smashan vasini she frees us from fear she removes fear completely she is the most fearful and terrifying aspect of the mahavidyas most scary part of the mahavidyas so why are we writing something like this that she is the scariest part of the mahavidyas for us to know that she can be you just visualize the bhairavi and anything deadly in the world can be sent back anything deadly you know just visualize bhairavi or you take her name or you just chant a mantra there is no evil eye there is no evil attacking you there is never any kind of black stuff attacking you no psychic attacks nothing she is herself such a fiery goddess that there isn't anything more fiery than her in this world yeah so she is the one who frees us from all the fear and very terrifying aspect of the mahavidya also called chidagni chidagni c h i d a g n i chidagni chidagni is chidakash this place is called chidakash the the space that you see when you close your brow when you close your eyes this you know when you just see a blank space when you close your eye this is called chidakash and she is the fire of this chidakash agni chidagni her name is also chidagni she shines with the fulgence of 10000 rising suns her glory when you see the mahavidya when you are in meditation and she gives you darshan your eyes are blinded with the effulgence of 10000 rising suns so much of glow is there in her in her presence yeah 10000 rising suns 
शी इज बून कॉन्फरिंग एंड फियर डिस्पेलिंग हर साधना इज डन टू गेट रीड ऑफ बैड स्पिरिट्स फिजिकल वीकनेस इवन इवन डिसीज एनी डिजीज इन द बॉडी भैरवी साधना शुड बी डन टू गेट रीड ऑफ बैड स्पिरिट्स एंड फिजिकल वीकनेस to get a beautiful spouse also for people who are not attracting love in their life yes and marriage or family related issues marriage or family related issues a school of tantra called bhairavi tantra a school of tantra called bhairavi tantra is also um is also called kundalini tantra kundalini tantra is bhairavi tantra basically Kundalini Tantra is Bhairavi Tantra, and the the sadhak or the student who is doing this tantra practice is called yogini. She is called a yogini, and the one who has graduated is called Bhairavi. The one who is graduated is called Bhairavi. I'm sure all of you are Bhairavis over here. <laughs> yeah. So a yogini is a student of the Kundalini. tantra practice and bhairavi is the graduate of this practice so she controls the electromagnetic radiations this is an important aspect she controls the electromagnetic radiations that come from outer space that come from outer space and and which act on us you know they act on us so she protects she controls the electromagnetic radiations that come from outer space and act on us she brings our karma to fruition and can dissolve everything into itself she can dissolve everything unto itself next point her energy has aspects of agni that means fire vidyut vidyut is lightning her energy has aspects as qualities of fire vidyut that means lightning and surya that is sun that means her energy has these three qualities of lightning vidyut yeah sun that is surya and agni fire that's why it is a powerful medicine for any disease to be healed that's why her energy is a powerful medicine for any disease to be healed i was doing uh, bhairavi sadhana uh, many years back i mean i don't know why i want to share this with you here I was doing Bhairavi Sadhana many years back in my room. I was sitting in my room on a comfortable sofa, and the AC was on. And I'm sitting and doing the mala. I was looking out of the window, and I was laughing at myself that people sit and do uh, sadhana in, on the smashana ground and uh, in hot, scorching heat and everything. And look at you! You want to sit comfortably in the AC and want to sit and do your sadhana. And however, my love for her is immense, and I I'm sure she understands. at that moment i get a treat for my eyes unbelievable treat for my eyes the room where i'm sitting and the window is there right there below there is a ganga ghat where the local villagers come and burn dead bodies at that moment i see three dead bodies coming and getting burnt in long big flames and she said doesn't matter my child you can sit in the ac and do your sadhana <laughs> you know it was as if she's giving me a endorsement that i'm here <laughs> it's absolutely amazing so the the agni vidyut and uh, the radiation that is why her her energy is so powerful it can it can eradicate any kind of sickness it's a very very powerful mantra for uh, disease and for curing also psychic attacks and you know a lot of things when i say she controls electromagnetic radiations that come from outer space it also means psychic attacks and also means you know other dimension interference that sometimes uh takes a person's mind into you know abstract thinking all kinds of un ununderstood and unexplainable kind of sicknesses or state of mind can better we can eradicate hmm? the 64 yoginis you can write this down the 64 yoginis are assistants to bhairavi they are assistants to bhairavi they utilize the power of kali and bhairavi they utilize the power of kali and bhairavi she has control over the mind and panchabhutas she has control over the mind and panchabhutas all right 
Let's come to Chinnamasta now. Any question is there, then you can ask me about these devis, all right? If there's a lot, there's a lot that I can give you, but we, we have our, you know, limitation of how much. Yes. Panchabhutas are five elements, dear. Bhuta, B-H, B-H, U-T-A or B-H-O-O-T-A. Let's come to Chinnamasta. She corresponds to planet Rahu. She corresponds to the shadow planet Rahu. Rahu and Ketu in Vedic astrology are two shadow planets. They're not there in the Western astrology, but they're there in India. Very important aspect of our astrological Rahu and Ketu. They are they're the, the cross, you know, whether where the orbits are crisscrossing. Rahu and Ketu, shadow planets. So Chinnamasta corresponds to Rahu. And all of you, those who understand Vedic astrology a little bit, understand that Rahu is a taskmaster and he's something that brings old karmic records into the present timeline and makes you experience intense karmas, you know, in a, in a lifetime. And Ketu is the one that liberates you of all the suffering. It takes you towards liberation. So Chinnamasta is corresponding to Rahu, which means that um, is a goddess that can help you, you know, to eradicate all the sufferings of past karmas, help you eradicate all the sufferings of past karmas. She also helps you to cut out the ego completely a, on a spiritual path when we are on a spiritual sadhana chinnamasta can help you eradicate your ego which is one of the major obstacles on the path and in fact you know in these devi invocations that all of you are doing i'm sure we were speaking nilimaji and me were speaking in the morning before we began the session that so many obstacles come on the path you know as you start taking a commitment to a 21 day sadhana or six months sadhana but so many obstacles come in between sometimes there is uh, you know so many layers uh, avarans and layers inside are peeled off ripped off and suddenly there is an outburst of emotion sometimes you break through so many layers of your conditioning and all of these obstacles are a very important aspect of sadhana you know sadhana is not a flowery kind of a path where you're going to be showered with more and more flowers from the heaven and you're going to be garlanded and taken them there, taken there, there with an embrace or, you know, on a flight somewhere. No, sadhana is ripping off all that is not truly you. It rips off all that is truly not you and brings out the luster of who you truly are. You know, we would have never visited that real you ever in your life because right from our cradle we are conditioned. Conditioned and conditioned and conditioned and given different aspects of personality that is not truly us. We don't know who we truly are until we are ripped apart of what we are not. You know, then we come in recognition with who we truly are. Very beautiful understanding of, you know, uh, a lotus bud. Example of a lotus bud is, is what I often give to my students. You know, there's a lotus bud, let's say, born in a pond. And the pond is very mucky. It's all very muddy and mucky and, you know, how it is where the lotuses grow. The lotus bud comes out in the garden and is looking everywhere all around the garden, trying to see the garden, the beauty. There are some roses there and she wants to have that red, beautiful color. There's a jasmine there. She wants to have this beautiful smell. And there are other flowers that are smelling, looking so beautiful. She's looking at all the flowers and wanting this and wanting that and wanting this and wanting that. Little realizing that she is a lotus bud and her freedom and her emancipation lies in becoming a beautiful lotus and nothing more, nothing less. She doesn't realize it because she doesn't reflect on herself. This is, this is our condition. And where, here where she is, in that muddy pond, is where she has to bloom into a beautiful lotus. If she recognizes that she is a lotus bud, then she will put her attention on her unfolding and allow the sunshine to shine on her and open petal by petal, allowing herself to bloom as a beautiful lotus, which is her only freedom and her only destiny. Hmm? This is the story of all of us. Unless we really recognize what we truly are, we just all the time want to be this and that and this and that. Little realizing that we don't have the freedom to become this and that, and that would be just an artificial avarana or a layer over us. So it's only on these beautiful, you know, times that you are here now that you get to reflect on your true self. Invoking the goddess inside you is seeking 
and urging her to show me who I am. This is the first prayer. Let me, let me see who I am. Let me understand, am I a lotus bud or am I a rosebud? Let me understand which flower am I meant to be? What are the colors that I've, you know, very organically, naturally, I have to bloom into. So understanding your true self is the, is the foundation of sadhana. Understanding your true self and then allowing God, because God is at the, at the core of all our cells, allowing God to come out with his energy and shine through us. Yeah? The lotus, a beautifully bloomed lotus, shines godly energy, emanates godly energy because it has allowed itself to grow in that mucky pond and, has, and is floating beautifully, allowing sunshine, allowing the water to bring her best. You know, bring herself as the best, right? So that is that is what sadhana is about. So, Chinnamasta, we are talking about Chinnamasta. So she, you see the picture of Chinnamasta, a cut out head. You know, it's, it's a terrifying picture. Her head is cut out and there are three fountains of something coming out and she's standing on a copulating couple. She's standing on a copulating couple, desire. You know, desire, she is victorious over desire. That's Kama and Rati, what is shown in the picture. It's Kama and Rati uh, in copulation. She's standing over them. It is symbolic of winning over desire. And, you know, cut out her head, is cut out her ego. Allowing the energy surge to go up. That's the Ida Pingla and the Sushamna that is coming out like three fountains from her head. One of the fountains she is drinking herself and the other two Dakinis are drinking, her assistants are drinking. The picture is very, very, uh, one would wonder what is this Devi that these Indians are worshipping, you know. <laughs> you know, one would wonder with the symbolism, because these Devis are not in any human form. They are formless. They are not having any human form. We have put them like that. If I was a crocodile, I would have shown all my Devis in crocodiles, you know. So, because we are human, we are creating all our gods and goddesses in human form. That's how we understand them. You know, the, the emotions and the thoughts behind them. So she is not a human, A. B, she is depicting our own existence. Chinnamasta is depicting our own existence, which when aroused, you know, to completion, the energy is completely aroused, it can come as a fountain of creativity with the Irapingla Pingla Sushamna activated and you win over desire, you know, which is at the, at the, at the very gross level, one of the biggest obstacles, right? So write down points for Shinnamasta. She, she corresponds to planet Rahu. Deepens, she deepens the capacity of a sadhak. She deepens the capacity of a sadhak to surrender and to let go. If you're stuck with something, she helps you to surrender and let go. She represents the spirit of sacrifice as a law of life. As a law of life. That means you have to give away something to get something. You have to get, get, get loose of something to, to acquire something. Everything in this world has a price, we say. You know, so Chindamasta teaches you this, all right? She, she teaches you the spirit of sacrifice as a law of life. The way of atonement on the path of karma. She is also called Prachand Chandika. Prachand, P-R-A-C-H-A-N-D. Prachand Chandika. C H A N D I K A. Next point court cases, government issues, stronghold in business, overcoming addictions or compulsive desires, attachment, obsessions can be healed with her sadhana. She signifies cutting off, cutting off. Of sensory inputs, she signifies cutting off of sensory inputs, plus the movement of the mind to tap the deep power inside. She enhances willpower, vision, sexual abstinence, and takes one to samadhi, and takes one to samadhi. She is worshipped through softer methods. She is worshipped through softer methods by householders, people who are in domestic life, for family happiness and conception, fertility, for family happiness and fertility. 
So the most important aspect about Chinnamasta is overcoming any kind of obsessions, addictions, attachments. You get stuck somewhere on your path and you want to move ahead. She will help you. Even Bhairavi does that, even Chinnamasta. Chinnamasta more so because she's at the Vishuddhi, purification center. The pure purification of your prana and thereafter the mind. The mind and the prana are wedded to each other. Always remember the mind and the prana are wedded to each other. The mind can control the prana and the prana can control the mind. You know, they are the pranamaya kosha and manonmaya kosha are hand in hand always. That's how all the healing happens. When you visualize somebody getting well, the prana goes there and the, she gets well. Similarly, when you do pranayama, then you're controlling the mind with your prana. They can both control each other. All right? So Bhairavi and Trinamasta both help you to eradicate obsession, attachment, and eradicate a lot of disease from the body. Okay? Then we come to, let's come to, yes? Okay. Let's come to Dhuma, Dhumavati. I love her. She's such a beautiful goddess. There is beauty in her countenance. There is compassion and deep love in her appearance. Very, very deep love in her appearance. She's depicted like that because she eradicates sorrow. She eradicates sorrow. Poverty. She eradicates poverty. You know, it's a very misunderstood goddess in the modern times, especially post-Puranic period. You know, after the Puranic period, when Navdurga is more popular, you know, and other stories connected with Mahavidyas are quite adulterated and not, they're very misleading. Dumavati, in some of the temples I've visited, uh, many of the Mahavidya temples, Dumavati darshan is banned. They be, you know, the, the pandits there don't allow you to go and take the darshan of Dumavati. She's isolated and kept in a room. Uh, they say, no, 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 you don't see Dhumavati because they have not understood Dhumavati. You know, you don't understand Dhumavati. They say, we get cursed if you see her, which is not true. She's an ocean of compassion. She eradicates poverty. She shows you the reality of how suffering is. Her, her depiction, her countenance and her entire is, is like a gray-colored, tattered something she's wearing with face, which is like uh, very weird and, you know, there, there is absolutely no color in her, in her picture that is depicted. That is because the artist at that time wanted you to understand she can remove all of this. All of the povertyized condition, povertyized condition, suffering because of having nothing, paucity of love, paucity of money, paucity of resources, paucity of friends. When a person feels completely povertyized, she is the queen of the heart, which corresponds with your heart and corresponds to planet Ketu. All right, write down, write down. Sorry to go so fast. Write down. Corresponds to planet Ketu. <laughs> and reflects all the aspects of life that we shun. She reflects all the aspects of life that we shun. That means the diseased, the destitute, the forlorn and outcast. Meditation on her yantra or form. The Mahavidyas can be invoked in both the ways. In fact, three ways. You can either do their mantra japa and focus on the energy that the sound gives you. Or you can focus on the yantras. Each of the Mahavidyas has yantra. I'll share a beautiful file. I'll share a PDF manual that I have. It's a long course that I do normally for 10 incantations. But uh, this is a small, and, and I wish that all of you have all of that. You will get all of that, I'm sure, in, in this short while that we are here. Yeah, so I'll share the manual, and I'll let, let this be there. With, there's a lot to be read in that. And uh, the yantra pictures are also there in the manual. You can focus on the yantra, you can focus on the mantra, or you can even focus on the picture that are there for the goddesses, all right? So either way, she blesses, yes? Uh, Dhumavati in the Mahalakshmi temple in Mumbai, yeah. when you go there, they first worship Dhumavati as a Lakshmi before they worship Lakshmi. I can understand completely. And uh, smoke, she's worshipped yes. with a smoky... With ashes and smoke, yes. yes, yes. That's beautiful because she removes poverty. Yes. That's so the, she's, the, she's considered the portal through whom you come to Lakshmi. Lovely. You submit lovely. to her... Uh, it's so beautiful. I'll, yeah. I'll surely go and see this. I want, yes. I want Indians to really revere her. And I'm happy that you shared this with me. I will definitely go and see this someday. Even in Maharashtra for Diwali, for mm. Lakshmi Puja, we first worship 
Her. So like, beautiful. The, uh, Lakshmi is worshipped before, so she yeah. takes you through to Lakshmi. So love, so lovely, so lovely. <laughs> All right. So meditation or a yantra or form deepens self as it truly is. It brings acceptance of things as they are, and opens wisdom, opens wisdom to understand transition. So very good mantra for somebody has died and is you know got into a deep well of sadness, not able to move on. Dumavati will help you to move on and cope up with transition. She'll help you to move on and cope up with transition. Also poverty conditions, like I said. All right. She makes one rise over inauspiciousness and unattractiveness. The fire in her hand symbolizes end of suffering. The fire in her hand. She's got a willow and fire in her hand. So the fire in her hand symbolizes end of suffering. And her winnowing basket removes unwanted things from within. So what is the, what are the, what is the sadhana of um, Dumavati done for? A. Her sadhana is done to get rid of extreme poverty. There is extreme poverty, eradicating deadly disease, tragedy, any kind of a catastrophe or a tragedy, and people who have dosha with Ketu. People who have in their astrology chart have dosha with Ketu. So you had explained Rahu and then Ketu. So can you just remind us of what Rahu does and Ketu then? Yes, what? Rahu and Ketu are always on a 180 degree axis. They're in, in the horoscope. They're always opposite 180 degree. They say that one is, one is the head of a snake and the other is the tail of a snake. Rahu is the head and Ketu is the tail. Rahu creates yearning and it creates extreme desire. Rahu represents desire and often carry forward from several lifetimes behind. You know, desire that is riding over the soul and is, is like so dominating. Rahu, wherever Rahu is sitting in the horos horoscope, it creates desire there. And Ketu fulfills this desire either by, you know, transcending it or by fulfilling it. So uh, Ketu is the means to what Rahu is seeking. It is always means to what Rahu is seeking. So Chinnamasta and Dumavati are complementing each other in the sadhana as well. Tomorrow I will talk about how the sadhana can be done. There is a male polarity and a feminine polarity in each of the Mahavidyas. I told you they are genderless. There is a male polarity and a feminine polarity in each of the goddess. There is an upward triangle and a downward triangle in each of the goddess. All right. The upward polarity is, is uh, there is a sequence to how the sadhana is done. You know, uh, for instance, Kali Sadhana, when you do a Kali Sadhana for 21 days, on the last day you complete with one uh, uh, repetition or one mala of the Kamlatmika. You know, they correspond, the other end of it. It's the second level, Tara Sadhana gets completed with Matangi, you know, and the Shodashi gets completed with Baglamukhi. We'll talk about this tomorrow, how the male and the female polarities are coexisting and how the sadhana is complete without a Shiva sadhana. In fact, uh, some of the later schools of Mahavidya insisted that uh, if you're doing a Mahavidya sadhana, then there should be a Shiva aradhana also to be done because where's the male polarity otherwise? But they were self-sustaining. They are energies that did not depend on the spouses for their existence, you know? <laughs> They are independent um, tubularity energies. They are within Ardhanareshwar energy, you know, where there is Nara and uh, there's a feminine and a male polarity. So within the Mahavidyas, the opposite polarity takes charge and completes the principle of Shiva there. We will talk about the sadhana tomorrow, okay? So let's complete Dhumavati. Medit yeah, this we have done. All objects, yeah. Ketu Lagna was what we did last. She helps you to transcend suffering right now. She helps you to transcend suffering and find hidden potential, find hidden potential behind pain. Acceptance of ugliness or old age, forgetting the past, remover of all frustration or agitation. She's a remover of all frustration or agitation. She is worshipped by tantrics for attainment of siddhis. She grants siddhis. She is worshipped by tantrics 
practitioners for attainment of siddhis. Let's come to Baglamukhi, Pitambari. She's also called Pitambari. But Baglamukhi is a very, they, these temples of Baglamukhi all over India are very beautiful temples because most of the people, they're very crowded often because people who are all facing legal problems, court cases and this and that. And she, she gives you an antidote for black magic. Baglamukhi gives you an antidote for black magic. And there are a lot of people who get inflicted mentally at least, that they start thinking and believing and come in a conviction that somebody has done something on them. And then Baglamukhi gives you a uh, release and relief from this mental, uh, you know, arrested condition. So she's called Pitambari. She's called Pitambari and a very powerful goddess corresponding to planet Mars. She corresponds to planet Mars. Fire energy, absolute fire energy. She is a goddess who has power to control and paralyze enemies. She can paralyze. That's why the picture of goddess you see, Baglamukhi. See, uh, the enemy is kneeling down. She's on the on the chariot, and she, the enemy is kneeling down and she's pulling out his tongue. You see the picture of Baglamukhi. She's pulling out the tongue. That means she's just throttled him and pulled out the power of you know. So that's not what the picture is. Not what. The reality is the picture is just a symbolic representation of she can stop, stamban. That is her power, stamban. Stamban is stop. She can stop anything which is moving. Huge energy that can stop anything which is moving or destroying something. All right? So she's a goddess who has power to control and paralyze enemies. So what are the enemies? You need not mean enemies here as people enemies. Your own mind your own destructive power, your own craziness sometimes, your own belief that is taking you towards destruction, misconceptions and myths that we are living with, anything. That is, you know, it can paralyze. It can put and hold and stop, right? So, she's portrayed in yellow dress and has golden complexion. Her sadhana is done for victory, to defeat... Again, court cases, legal lawsuits and court cases, and success in all competitions. So a lot of sports people do Baglamukhi sadhana also. Success in all competitions, people who are preparing for the administrative services and people who they take some kalpas for Baglamukhi. I went uh, to the uh, uh, Dathiya temple at, in Madhya Pradesh, very strong, beautiful Pitambari mat is there. Very beautiful goddess, small uh, idol of goddess, but so it's crowded. So many people go there with taking sankalpas for this and for that and this and that. And Sakam sadhana, we call it Sakam sadhana. For those of you who are from the West here, you know, there is Nishkam sadhana and there is Sakam sadhana. Nishkam sadhana is when you don't have a desire other than her embrace and her love and to be dissolved in her. That is Nishkam Sadhana, which is the highest level of doing Sadhana. When there isn't any pinpointed desire, you're just doing it for the love of the Goddess and to be one with her. It's considered to be the highest level of Sadhana. And, and Sakam Sadhana is when you have a particular desire, you know, and then you take a Sakam. Sakam means, calm means desire. So with desire, so you can take a 21-day Sadhana for winning this competition or doing this or... Because the world is your playground and you are as mortals playing here, so you have every right to fulfill your desires. However, when a sadhak sees that one desire is fulfilled and another is born and another is fulfilled and another is born, then you realize that nishkam sadhana, I will get it all. If I get my mother, my mother will give me everything. You know, so I rather not ask her 10 things separately, but I ask her for her love. This is, this is the most intelligent thing to do is to do Nishkam Sadhana. Because in that, the ocean of compassion engulfs you and you get everything. And you, you, if you're not getting something, then that's not good for you. And one should accept that as a mother's grace. That this is not good for me and so I'm not getting this. If she dissolves the desire that is not good for your path. She dissolves the desire which is not good for your path. And this is what, the most intelligent thing to do is to do Nishkam Sadhana. So spiritually, she represents application of stunning power. Spiritually, she represents application of the stunning power of truth to win over any negativity of the mind. To win over any negativity of the mind. Plus, or also, silencing confusion and doubt. 
to silence confusion and doubt. She is energy which stops. She is energy which stops movement. She is energy which stops movement at the appropriate time. She enhances inner silence, stillness in asana practice. When you are doing your yoga asanas, she blesses you with stillness in your asana practice. Okay? Willpower. And again, kumbhaka. Willpower and kumbhaka. Kumbhaka is the space between your breath. Between inhalation and exhalation, the space in between is called kumbhaka. When you hold, when you hold the breath, that's called kumbhaka. There is an inner kumbhaka and there is a bahya kumbhaka. Both of these enhance. The inner kumbhaka strengthens your ribcage and strengthens your breath and lungs. Inner kumbhaka. Because you intake the breath and hold the breath to a count. You know, when you do pranayama, it is taught how long, how many counts you should hold. But bahya kumbhaka, that means when you're exhaling and then stopping the breath, is extraordinarily transcending in nature and can take you into deep levels of samadhi. Most of the yogis practice Bahya Kumbhak because it is transcending. She can enhance your Bahya Kumbhak to take you to inner peace and take you into a state of Samadhi very soon. Okay? Mars. Yeah, Mars. Baglamukhi is Mars. Let's come to Matangi. Corresponds to planet Sun. Matangi is corresponding to planet Sun. She's called Tantric Saraswati. Tara and Matangi are Tantric Saraswati. Matangi is beautifully depicted. You know, I saw a beautiful movie. I must share this with you. Saw a very beautiful, I think it was a Kannada movie uh, or a Telugu movie. I'm not sure, but I think it was Kannada. And there was a Shankaracharya who was visiting somebody's house uh, because that, that, that family had a beautiful Devi sitting there and they wanted the consecration of that Devi to be done by Shankaracharya and so he was invited and there was punch, there was a lot of bhojan and a lot of you know sweets and uh, food and all cooked and so many flowers and everything done for the Devi and the Guru was to come and bless the house you know in that house there was a servant maid there was a maid who was also a Devi Upasak and she loved the Devi so in her small sweet way on a plate, she was putting her Devi, she was doing everything what those people were doing in a big way. You know, she was putting small little laddu and small little flour and small little and wiping the Devi with her cloth and, you know, holding that plate as if I have done everything what they have done now in my small plate. And she was not allowed in that room because she was a maid and she was sitting outside. So when Shankaracharya comes there to perform the puja, and uh, he can see because he's a, you know, Trikal Darshi, he can see the Devi living. And the Devi quickly moves from there and goes and sits in that small plate where the maid is sitting with her worship. You know, and Shankaracharya sees this and that Devi is Matangi because she's green, dark green, what they've shown in the movie. I understand she's Matangi. So she, she uh, Shankaracharya sees that the Devi is gone and sitting there and eating that food, what that lady had put there, that lady had put all jutha food. Jutha food is like she had already tasted whether it is sweet or not. She tasted everything and kept there for the Devi because she said I, sh I should be sure that this is too good for her. And the Devi sits and happily eats there and Shankaracharya is asking her what? You are not sitting there, you are sitting there. And she says I am loving it. You know so Matangi is, is it is said that she likes Uchishta food. Uchishta is like tasted. Something that I've already put in my mouth and I'm offering it to her. And she's the goddess for the outcast and for all downtrodden people who really love her. You know, who really love her. All right. She corresponds to sun. She's tantric Saraswati. Blesses us with speech, music, knowledge and arts. Blesses us with speech, music, knowledge and arts. She's also called Uchishta Chandalini. Uchishta, how do you spell this in English? U-C-C-H-I-S-H-T-A Chandalini It means leftover food. Uchishta means leftover food. She is associated with removing pollution and impurity and conditioning. Pollution, impurity and conditioning. Her worship is done in a Raja Matangi form. Raja Matangi form. 
she is worshipped as a Raja Matang, like a queen. Raja Matangi form. She is worshipped in a Raja Matangi form, often shown holding a veena. You will see her holding a musical instrument, veena. And always has a parrot. Always has a parrot. They say that when Matangi blesses, when you are doing sadhana, you know, they, it, it, these, these things are to be experienced, okay? These are not bookish things. These are most of the things that I am talking about are experienced by me. We went to the Dhumavati temple. Me and Siddha had gone together to the Dhumavati temple in Madhya Pradesh, what I said, what I said, Baglamukhi temple, Dattiya. And the Dhumavati was banned. She said not to see. And I said, come on, we have to see her. How can we not see her? And the Pandit, because we went in a VIP darshan, you know, and all that. So the Pandit specifically said, no, 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 aap maha jayenge. Like that, like that. And took us there. And we, me and Siddha were looking at each other. We went and sat in the car and a big crow came and sat on our car. You know, <laughs> crow is representing the Dhumavati. Similarly, the parrots, you know, if you're doing sadhana of Matangi, you'll see parrots here and there. I mean, it's really, uh, you know, sometimes you wonder when you come into your human logic, then you don't believe in all these things. But when you come into that transcended mode and merging with your Devi and flowing with your Devi, you see her music everywhere. And you see she's representing it in all small, small gestures she's making and, you know, flashing on your eyes things that are so unbelievable, un uncanny, right? <laughs> uh, Meenakshi Madurai also has a parrot. Also has a parrot, yes, yes. Is that the same goddess or a different one? Could though? be because there's so many, you know, form, these Mahavidyas have glorified and modified into so many other goddesses. Kamlatmika, for instance, all the Ashtalakshmis have come out from Kamlatmika. Similarly, Matangi is there in South. A lot of Matangi forms are there. Yeah. All right. So she is uh, depicted with a parrot. Like Bagla Mukhi, she gives supernatural power. So a lot of, you know, the so-called witchcraft, they say, but I don't use that word. I say a lot of magic is done with uh, Matangi sadhana, you know, enthralling magic. Uh, yes, Siddhis, Siddhis. Baglamukhi, Matangi and Kamlatmika give you, especially Baglamukhi and Matangi. Lot of Siddhis. Chindamasta also. Lot of Siddhis. So, supernatural. She is a giving of, giver of supernatural powers. Ashta Siddhis, attraction, mesmerizing, power of speech is her speciality. Bestows perception, learning, reasoning and skillfulness so all kinds of arts performing arts you know music dancers uh, painters they all of these you know um, in india all kinds of arts people we have a lot of artists here all of you know that even the tribal ones the ones that are living in tribes they also have this conviction and belief that if we are blessed with an ability to do something exceptionally well, there is a sadhana connected to it. And everybody does mantra japa. Everybody does mantra japa. Musicians, I mean, all good singers here in our country, all of them do sadhana with mantras, with meditation. M meditation and japa, these are two inseparable forms of doing sadhana. What mantra needs to be decided by your teacher guru or by your mentor guide what is beneficial for you, what is to remove an obstruction from your path or to enhance the skills that you have or to whatever your intention is or to be one with God. So japa can be can vary with meditation is a common factor to all the sadhaks, to all the performers, to all the artists. Everybody does meditation and japa here. All right. So she, she is uh, the sadhana of Matangi gives you all performing arts, all kinds of uh, music and artists, paint, painters, uh, even orators, people who speak very well, you know, they also do matangi sadhana to have that grip and that mesmerizing power in their speech. You know, your speech is not just what you hear. You have four levels of speech. We have the para, paschanti, madhyama and the vaikhari. There are four levels of speech we have. The para, paschanti and madhyama is not heard at all. It's only the Vaikhari that you are hearing. However, what you are hearing is laced with the Madhyama 
is laced with the paschanti, which is the envisioning and the power of manifestation, and para, which is the highest uh, frequency of sound that is extremely and extraordinarily spiritual in nature. So when somebody does a sadhana of matangi, say for instance, he or she is blessed with all four levels of excellence in their power of speech, in their speech. Vaikari in itself is very flat. It's the gross that you hear. But para and paschanti especially are mesmerizing. You know, you hear orators speak, very good orators speak. They have thousands of people in their grip. You know, when they're talking, their minds are in their grip. Everything that he or she says is going right into their heart. This power is not the power of Vaikari, it's the power of the para shakti and the paschanti that goes through the speech. Okay? Women today really need this to find their voice. Yes, yes, yes. All right. So it cure, her mantra can cure stammering. Write down. Her mantra can cure stammering and the ability, or the inability to listen. Some people can't just listen. You know, shravana shakti. So her mantra helps cure stammering and also inability to listen. Sometimes even deafness, literally speaking. Yeah, stammering and inability to listen. She loves red hibiscus flowers. She loves red hibiscus flowers. Her yantra sadhana, focus on her yantra. Her yantra sadhana purifies speech, enhances creativity, and blesses, and blesses the person with extraordinariness. Versatility, multitasking. That was Matangi. All right. Next and last we have Kamlatmika. Corresponds to planet Venus. Kamlatmika corresponds to planet Venus. She is the Tantric Lakshmi. She is the Tantric form of Lakshmi. What, what modern day we, we talk of Lakshmi. The, the, the goddess who sits on the lotus and is pouring out money from her hands in abundance. You know, she she's cor corresponding to Lakshmi. Her sadhana is done for wealth and prosperity, for comfort and luxuries. Wealth, prosperity, comfort and luxuries. She loves white hibiscus flowers, lilies and lotuses. Now, although you know the Lakshmi, Lak Kamlatmika is coming on the, on the right at the bottom, but she has the powers of all the goddesses, if you see. You know, the Kali is there in Tara, Kali and Tara is there in Shodashi, Kali Tara Shodashi is there in Bhuvneshwari, Kali Tara Shodashi Bhuvneshwari is there in Bhairavi, Kali Tara Shodashi Bhuvneshwari Bhairavi is there in Chinnamasta. All of them are concentrated till the Kamlatmika has the powers of all the goddesses. Therefore, she is the most worshipped in the world because she can, through the Lakshmi form, through the Kamlatmika form, you can contact any goddess, number one. Number two, because worldly fulfillment is what most of the people are seeking. And because there's a Kali in her, she can even take you to spiritual heights. That's why most popular among all the goddesses is the Kamlatmika. Yeah? Easy to appease. Low sperm count. Virility is one of the aspects of Kamlatmika because she is responsible for the population. You know, Kamlatmika is the, is the earthly goddess. She's responsible for population. So low sperm count or infertility issues can be healed with Kamlatmika sadhana. Low sperm count, infertility issues. Uterine, yeah, uterine problems, menstrual issues, financial crisis. Then Venus-Mars conjunct is a very typical astrological issue that a lot of people talk about. Venus and Mars can create a lot of havoc together, being very close planets to Earth. So Venus, write down, then I'll explain something more. Venus-Mars conjunct or Venus with Rahu or Ketu. The astrological impact of this can be cured with her sadhana. The astrological impact of this conjunction can be cured with her sadhana. To cut short, you know, Mars represents aggression or fire and Venus represents um, uh, marriage and, uh, you know, fertility, etc. 
So when people have these two planets together, often there are issues related to not getting married or over-sexual uh, desires or under or over-function of these two planets. So any aberration with these two planets, impact on the astrology is often given a solution as Kamlatmika Sadhana. Infertility for, for sure, you know, uh, people who are not childless couple, both the husband and wife do the Kamla Sadhana together. It really brings in a lot of fertility you know, uh, energy, yeah. All right, sharing wealth, beauty, and enjoyment in order to obey the magic law of karma. She blesses sharing wealth, beauty, and enjoyment in order to obey the magic law of karma. Sharing wealth, beauty, and enjoyment in order to obey the magic law of karma. Her worship is completed only when one starts giving. Her worship is completed only when one starts giving. So this sentence is mentioned here because for most of the people who have worldly issues and they want to get over the worldly issues, let's say abundance, you want to invite abundance in your life and you're starting a Kamlatmika sadhana, you know, understand that her worship will be completed only when I start giving. So you take your sankalpa in such a way that, you know, I, I wish to have so, such and such, so and so, things flowing to me and I pray to the goddess to bestow me or grant me and I promise to give away this, 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 this. You know, so all of the sadhana is like a give and take with the world. Yeah, that's how she blesses. She blesses when you are ready to give away. This, this is what is the condition. Yeah. Does that make sense? Lovely. <laughs> So we, we are done with the 10 uh, Mahavidyas and introduction. Tomorrow I will take you on a beautiful journey of how you can do healings with them and how do you invoke uh, the goddesses inside you. We'll do a Shakti point meditation, um, you know, invocation tomorrow. And also for every goddess, there's a voice file that I'll share with you, where, uh, uh, a mantra for every goddess, a meditation file. Uh, Every goddess is invoked with a mantra and I'll share that with you. You can share it with them. And a small prayer of the goddesses, which I'll do right now, but that is recorded. I'll share that as well. So all of you will get it. So three things I'm promising to share with you today. One is a manual, a very beautiful, rich manual compiled, of course, gathered things from here and there, from different people, from different books, etc. It's a compilation, but very concise, precise and to the point. All right. Second, two audio files and the pictures of all the goddesses so that you can have a look at all of them. All right, any question? Does anybody have any question? Yes? Yes, that's a good question, dear. What do you mean by Tantric Lakshmi? Or tantric yeah, I, it, it's important for me to ask, uh, just a second, about what is Tantric. So, you know, I, we, I just now spoke about the white, the black, white and red aspect, the three gunas we have in our universe. Everything is trigunatmak. This prakriti is trigunatmak. That means we are ruled by the three gunas. In each one of you, in each one of us, you know, we have a little bit of sattva, a little bit of uh, rajas, and a little bit of tamas. Sattva is represented with color white and is absolute purity and God orientation, upward growth. The movement of sattva is upward. Rajas is pure practicality, passion, and worldly growth, sustenance, you know, uh, the desire, passion for life. Colors for life is rajas in the middle. Rajas is good when it is when it collaborates with sattva. It gives you grandeur and 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 a kingly status. But rajas is in the middle. It can also collaborate with tamas, give you excessive hunger and desire. All right. So rajas is in the middle, the red. And then there's black, which represents resolution, destruction, annihilation, removal, which is inevitable. We don't view black as negative, but we view it as undesirable things in us. We view it as undesirable things in us. So everything in this nature is trigunatmak, governed by these three gunas. Everything that we think is trigunatmak, at this moment I may be rajasic in my speech, at other moment I can be very meditative and sattvic in my speech, at other moment I can be scolding someone and tamasic in my speech. All right, so everything, every aspect of universe is trigunatmak and so is worship. Worship also, there is sattvic worship in which happens only meditation. Meditation is pure sattva. Meditation is pure sattva because it is an effort to transcend even the sattva and go into nirguna, Paramatma. Paramatma is nirguna. 
ನಿರ್ಗುಣ ನಿಷ್ಕ್ರಿಯ ನಿತ್ಯ ನಿರ್ವಿಕಲ್ಪ ನಿರಂಜನ ನಿರ್ವಿಕಾರ ನಿರಾಕಾರ ನಿತ್ಯ ಮುಕ್ತೋಸ್ಮಿ ನಿರ್ಮಲ ದಟ್ಸ್ ಅ ಡೆಫಿನೇಷನ್ ಆಫ್ ಕಾನ್ಶಿಯಸ್ನೆಸ್ ಇಟ್ಸ್ ಬಿಯಾಂಡ್ ಗುನಾಸ್ ಸೊ ವೆನ್ ವಿ ಆರ್ ಡೂಯಿಂಗ್ ಸಾತ್ವಿಕ್ ವರ್ಷಿಪ್ ವಿ ಆರ್ ಮೆಡಿಟೇಟಿಂಗ್ ದರ್ ಇಸ್ ನೋ ಡಿಸೈಯರ್ ದೇ ದರ್ ಇಸ್ ನಥಿಂಗ್ ಇಟ್ಸ್ ಓನ್ಲಿ ಪ್ಯೋರ್ ಪ್ಯೋರ್ ಸತ್ವ ದಟ್ ಇಸ್ ವಾಂಟಿಂಗ್ ಟು ಟ್ರಾನ್ಸೆಂಡ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಗೋ ಇನ್ ಟು ಬಿಯಾಂಡ್ ಗುನಾಸ್ ರಾಜಸಿಕ್ ವರ್ಷಿಪ್ is all what you see in india with all the ghanti and pool and color and you know the bhajan and kirtan this is all rajas you know the prasad and the grandeur and all the elaboration of the aarti and dance and hare krishna all of this is rajas all right that wants to embrace the sattva and go beyond all right the tamasic practices are called tantric practices they are not negative but they take the power of the dark to transcend and go to the sattva and beyond the tantric practices all fall in the the you know the the last level of the worship in tamasic they are very profound because they utilize the power of the dark they are very profound because they utilize the power of the dark and can transcend in no time transcendence is very easy through the tantric practices because it jumps straight out of the tunnel into the light all right within the tantric practices or the, uh, the, the tamas field also you have the tantric practices are also done in sattva rajas and tamas mode tantric practices which follow meditations and kriyas are satvik in nature tantric practices which focus on mandalas and on yantras and on the shri yantra and all the their rajasik raja rajeshwari that's why it is called raja rajeshwari it's a rajasik practice all right so when you have a, a yantra to focus on or a idol or a pyramid or a shri yantra to focus on and it's all red and beautiful yellow and it's all grandeur then it is tantric rajasik practice and when you have the tantric tamasic practice this is the left hand tantra that people follow you know the uh, sometimes utilizing sex as a ritual or uh, invoking the black dark energies taking the ghosts and the you know other dimensions into their control to whatever you know so they are dark dark practices which which not many of us have touched or want to touch we all of us have experienced tantric sattva and tantric rajas which is very transcending very fast that's why tantric practices are very popular they are very popular they are very intriguing they are very mesmerizing they are very attractive very magnetic because it pulls you into and transcendence is very easy does that answer your question dear yes 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 the shodashi the shri vidya itself you know uh, is practiced in all the three levels it's practiced in all the, especially the two two levels raja rajeshwari sadhana when you go into dhyana you are in tantric sattva the dhyana on the mantra or the bija akshar and holding it on the chidakash itself is tan- tantric sattvic practice yeah right? and when the desire dissolves into the sattva it is tantric sattva practice the we we have a very beautiful i live in uh, kirti hermitage uh, nilima ji introduced me I live in Kirti Hermitage which is a bank on the uh, bank on the Ganga and we have a very beautiful tantric Ganesha as our residing deity there uh, he is with uh, with 10 hands and a Lakshmi sitting in his lap so th- th- this is a tantric sattvic practice because it takes us into transcendence through the shakti into consciousness it's purush and prakriti the Ganesha 10 10 hands Ganesha represents consciousness itself and the shakti represents the devi pushti lakshmi so the practice takes you into through the lakshmi into the sattva tantric sattvic practices are all meditative practices after mantra japa the dhyana which is done it takes you into sattva i would love to just read out a a, a prayer for the devi before we end i would love you to just meditate be in a meditative silence be in a loving accepting receiving silence have that beautiful smile on your face when your eyes are closed and just listen to the to the devi mahima the das mahavidya stotra this is uh from the mundamala tantra you know scripture all right om 
with your feet grounded, eyes closed, attention taken deep into your heart, invoking the entire series of Devis inside. Namaste Chandike Chandi Chandamunda Vinashini Namaste Kalike Kala Mahabhaya Vinashini Shive Raksha Jagatatri Prasida Harivallabhe Pranamami Jagatatrim Jagatapala Nakarinim Jagatashobha Karim Vidyam Jagatashrishti Vidhainim Karalam Vikatam Ghoram Mundamala Vibhushitam Harar Chitam Harar Adhyam Namami Haravallabham Gaurim Guru Priyam Gauravarla Lankara Bhushitam Hari Priyam Mahamayam Namami Brahma Pujitam Siddham Siddheshwarim Siddha Vidya Dharaganairyutam Mantra Siddhi Pradam Yoni Siddhi Dam Linga Shobitam Pranamami Mahamayam Durga Durga Tinashinim Ugram Ugramaim Ugrataram Ugra Ganairyutam Nilam Nila Ghanashamam Namami Nila Sundarim Shamangi Shama Ghatikam Shama Varna Vibhushitam Pranamami Jagatatrim Gaurim Sarvartha Sadinim Vishveshwarim Mahagoram Vikatam Goranadinim Adhyam Madhyam Guru Radhyam Madhyanata Prapujitam Shri Durgam Dhanadaman Napurnam Padmam Sureshwarim Pranamami Jagatatrim Chandra Shekhar Vallabham Tripura Sundarim Balama Balagana Bhushitam Shivadutim Shivaradhyam Shivadheyam Sanatanim Sundarim Tarinim Sarva Shivagana Vibhushitam Narayanim Vishnu Pujam Brahma Vishnu Hara Priyam Sarva Siddhi Pradam Nityam Anityagana Varjitam Sagunam Nirgunam Dheyam Architam Sarva Siddhi Dham Vidyam Siddhi Pradam Vidyam Maha Vidya Maheshwarim Mahesha Bhaktam Maheshim Mahakala Prapujitam Pranamami Jagadhatrim Shumbhasura Vimardinim Rakta Priyam Rakta Varanam Rakta Bija Vimardinim Bhairavim Bhuvanam Devim Lola Jivhasureshwarim Chatur Bhujam Dasha Bhujam Ashta Dasha Bhujam Shubham Tripureshim Vishwanatha Priyam Vishveshwarim Shivam Attahasa Mattahasa Priyam Dhumra Vinashinim Kamalam Chinnamastam Cha Matangim Surasundarim Shodashim Vijayam Bhimam Dhumram Cha Bagalamukim Sarva Siddhi Pradam Sarva Vidya Mantra Vishodinim Pranamamim Jagattaram Saram Mantra Siddhaye Ittevam Bavararohe Stotram Siddhi Karam Priyam Patitva Moksha Mapnoti Satyam Vaigirinandinim Om Niti Shri Munda Mala Tantre Eka Dasha Patale Mahavidya Stotram Sampoornam